Well, time to take a look through the Sunday papers now. I'm joined by the writer Stanley Johnson, the broadcaster Esther Ranson, and the former head of the Metropolitan Police, Ian Blair. Very good to see you all. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll stay with you, Lord Blair, and dive straight in. Front page of The Observer. Brussels just, I mean, laying it on the line here, saying you can't really do much to um, deal with migration or immigration from within the European Union. Well, well this is turning into almost a soap opera, I think. Uh, we've got... Um, Martin Schulz now telling uh, Britain that it can't do anything about... Uh, he's the he's European the Parliamentary President. Pa president of the, of the European uh, Parliament, telling Britain that, that uh, Britain can't do anything about the free movement of uh, workers, and that includes moving for benefit. You, if you read The Telegraph, you've got Ian Duncan Smith saying, we can. Uh, Sunday Times is running on the front page. And, and there's something going on here about the, particularly the Conservative Party having a conversation with itself. The, mm. the Telegraph's got 95 Conservative MPs uh, demanding a change to the law so that Euro British law can override European law, which would destroy the European Union from the beginning. This week has seen uh, a bill in the House of Lords to try and get a referendum in 2017, which is a waste of time because no parliament can bind its successor. So it's a complete it's also conversation. A time, a time you, I mean, and it's not just the Conservatives, isn't it? Because it's, it came from Chaka Umana. They, I mean, this this issue on the on the front of the Observer from the Labour side, Stanley <laughs> Johnson, who was, who was yeah, talking about looking at uh, some of the, the, the categories of migration within the European Union. I spent 20 years in the EU institutions, if yeah. you add the you know, my time in the Parliament with my time in the Commission, I think realistically there have to be some changes on this free movement. Not just because of the migration thing, but because you actually have had, over the last 10 years, a colossal increase in the population of Britain. And if we can't have a say in what kind of population, you know, in terms of sheer numbers we have, then I think this is a very right, bad thing. But news. I mean, the only answer is it's the UKIP answer, isn't it? It's to leave the European Union. You, can, you can't meddle, you can't tinker within the margins. Well, you, you can, because the free movement of Labour has only recently been implemented throughout Europe, so you could have a few retrograde steps and say, look, actually, we've got to start looking at some of these things and have a, mm. a backtrack on it. But, I mean, you know, practically, what do you think, Esther? I mean, so therefore, I mean, if you did, you would have, let's say, somebody turning up uh, at an airport or a port saying, right, you know, I'm from Poland, here's my family, I want to look at Big Ben and ride on a big red bus, and then they go and look for a job. I mean, how do you... Uh, how do you categorise people coming from within the European Union? Well, I think we have to accept that what the statistics tell us, which is that immigration is a good thing economically for us. And it's a good thing in many, many different ways. I remember going to a comprehensive school in Luton South where the head teacher told me that she depended upon migrant children to set standards to provide role models for the indigenous kids because they're ambitious, they want to learn, they prize education. <coughs> That being said, Europe has changed so much in my lifetime. I was an ardent pro-European at the beginning, wanted us in. But there's no question that there's a lot of imbalance now between the various nations joining together. And I think the whole, I don't think it is a, a, a conservative issue, Ian. I think it's a European issue. I think Europe needs to look at this and work out what's sensible, what works. Uh, last, last thought on that. I mean, what? just on the migration <coughs> issue within the borders of the European I mean, Union, I, could, I could something be I, I couldn't disagree, uh, I couldn't agree more that the, the, the expansion of mm. Europe is a very significant factor. Mm. But what needs to happen is we need to have the conversation from within Europe, rather than standing there and saying, if you don't agree with, with our changes, we're leaving the club. Well, the answer to that is leave the club. OK, uh, another story. Stanley Johnson, uh, taxpayers foot the bill for HS2. This is the second high-speed uh, rail line. Uh, three hundred million pounds already spent. What on? Well, it's been, been spent on a whole lot of <coughs> preliminary work. I've got to declare an interest there. This, this, I must declare an interest. This train line is going to go within Seriously. seven metres of my of my front door. And the point I'm making Seven here, inches. yes, I mean, we, it, it was cooked up by, by Labour, Co Labour, Labour government before the last election to give it a kind of you know, <laughs> sense of modernity. Well, 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 it's this government, Mr Cameron, really well, pushing it forward. Uh, they, have to, they have to back off because the real problem at the moment, we have Lord Adonis of Camden. I think he ought to give, give up his title, at least give up the Camden part uh, of his title. Because Camden, where I live, is going to be completely wiped out. And in a nutshell, one of the real problems is they have no provision for compensation unless you're actually knocked down. How it's much, ludicrous. So you're not going to get anything for the fact that you could sort of leap onto it as it passed your back door or front door? Or There'll be some leap. We're going to get uh, uh, about 20 years of disruption, mega disruption. And what <laughs> and would uh, that be worth in the Stanley Johnson household, do you think? 
Many to haircuts. Totally bizarre. <laughs> totally bizarre. <bad. laughs> We're getting on to haircuts. Th thank you very much, Steve, for that. We're getting on to haircuts uh, in a moment or two. But uh, I just wanted to pick out for us, though, Stanley, some of the things. You know, people surprised that nearly a third of a billion pounds has already been spent. This is on the front of the Telegraph, isn't it? I mean, what, you know, what, what on earth have they spent that amount of money on? Well, the, the thought of detail engineering, which has to go, has to go into, the, <coughs> into the thing. I mean, you've got tunnels to build, you've got viaducts to build. It's, it's, it's a lot of detail work. Sudden mind has gone to a firm called KPMG to produce a study saying, yes, it's a jolly good idea. Yes, <laughs> PR <laughs> campaign. In <laughs> anyway, but actually, I think that in France, they do do it differently. That, that, I, I did the um, Newbury Bypass with Swampy. Um, ah, yes. Again, I noticed the French were building the TGV. They compensate people extremely well, and there's no arguments. And they get on with it. Um, but, we, but of course, what we do is, I remember a particular bit of the, the, that road, um, ran through a line of houses and they just compensated the three houses they knocked down so people got a motorway at, at the end of their garden. Bit of sympathy for Stanley there. Ah, Esther, yeah. you, you, your first story and this is on the front page of the uh, Sunday Times, uh, I suppose in the wake of Savile, 20 private schools facing yeah. ruinous child sex abuse. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Paedophiles are vile, callous criminals who target vulnerable kids. And if there are kids whose parents are a long way away and they're quite young, uh, a teacher in authority in the olden days, and maybe today, who knows, could have his wicked way with them. But there are two things about this story which really, really annoy me. One is um, a lawyer, one lawyer representing the kids, and now grown up, of course, says the new cases were drawn from the upper echelons of society, which was unusual in child sex abuse claims. What planet's he living on? Does he think that only common kids get sexually abused? Has he let well, heavens? So, sack that lawyer. Sack him. Second, uh, he ran some calls for, for sacking. And then the other thing, equally stupid and uninformed about child abuse, says, what is most unsettling, said this writer in the Sunday Times, is that the teacher involved were all popular with boys and staff. None came close to the caricature of the teacher abuser as a creepy weirdo. Dear me. Yeah. What we know wow. is <coughs> that monsters don't get near children, nice men do. Obviously, the people who want to win the confidence and trust, not just of the kids they're grooming, but the adults around them, will appear to be the most popular, successful, happy-go-lucky mm. teachers. But that's some real stereotyping there, isn't there? Really? Esther, yeah. Esther, Esther, Stanley, didn't some of the, the Johnsons go to one of the schools mentioned? I mean, you'd be keen, yes, to, keen to find out. Yes, four out of a potential six <laughs> went to um, one of the schools. I'm going to put in a word for this school at the moment. Ashdown House on the front page mm. uh, of your paper, yeah. Esther. Well, I'm, I'm going to put in a word for it. You did a very good job as far as it's concerned. I know nothing about these allegations. That's what Manuel said in um, 40 Tires, if you remember. <laughs> I know You're nothing. Not from Barcelona. <laughs> I know nothing, and I'm going to stick with saying these are good schools until it's proved otherwise. Okay. I want to say 0800 If any young person watching this program is suffering at the hands of teacher or anyone else, Childline is there for you, Childline will listen, and it's confidential and safe. It's open day and night. 0800 1111. OK, uh, let's uh, go to a very much lighter story. Lord Blair, the, uh, the male, uh, and I love this, a £90 hairdo is fine, Dave, but only if you're a lady. This is, about, this is uh, a lovely piece. Which yes. is, there's actually Mr. two Cameron's pieces hairdos. in the mail, <laughs> mail on Sunday about <laughs> Mr Cameron's hairdos. The first one is brilliantly called Crumper Great, Crumper Gate. Okay. Uh, and but this, but this particular piece actually also indicates who what other people are spending so we've got Nick Clegg at 20 pounds Andrew Lansley at 15 pounds I hear Richard Dannett only pays five pounds um, and it depend right, on boldness? Well, I don't well, know I, was going to say I don't, know, I don't <laughs> know but the great line what, is what this. about you how much do you spend then? I spent th about 13 I think is oh, 13, yeah. very good. Says, and you don't I'm on 20 quid I'm afraid yeah you know. well, well it does look it's, worse it's more London. forgive me yeah, yeah, absolutely. It looks, it looks I, right. I go to Aussie the barber you don't come anywhere Aussie the barber in Camden Town. But you have a genetic <laughs> hair um, eccentricity, don't there's, there's, you? There's, you and your son. There's still a, a, a great quote in here. Oh. It says that men are now getting the same treatment women have endured for years. Oh, look at him with his bald spot. <laughs> 
he's spending ninety pounds and he still looks like a potato. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, uh, let's uh, let, let's move on uh, over to uh, Stanley. Um, caution: your mobile phone is watching you. I mean, people kind of knew this already, didn't they? That you, this you is the David be Davis. Anyway, if you got this your is the David on. Davis story. David Davis, a remarkable man, uh, absolutely remarkable, a fighter for civil liberties, has pointed out in a longish article in the in the Mail on Sunday that the government, through its use of what's called metadata, jolly well knows every time you ring someone up, they know who you ring up, they know where you run up from, they can track you. You call that, you call S a ransom, it's known. You call child line, I'll be calling that new line you've just said up there, so called silver line. Quite right. You know. Well, I say to myself, David Davis is on the right, on the right track here. We cannot allow government to know too much about what we're doing. Mm. I think he's absolutely on the wrong track. This is a life-saving matter. If two children have gone missing, yeah. if oh. they've gone missing with their mobile phones... And you would suspect that right now that's one thing that's been done, is finding the phones are still on. If they're looking, it's not even when they're on. They can be off. It's right. like, that's how all the um, more worrying. Someone, that's... someone might know. I mean, well, this is an old Blair. Yeah, well, I mean, because you know, he knows about the policing yeah, aspect of it. Is if you have a murder in a field in Berkshire, the first question you ask is what phones have been in that field. Do you remember the little girls in Soho? <sighs> they, they tracked where they'd been, right. and yeah. that's how they found a, the end. And a missing thing. child who's going to hang herself, she runs child line, says can she's you... going to hang herself, she disappears okay, I'm sure with you, her phone. I'm sure you don't disagree with that, Sam. But disagree. what you want is the I, checks and balances. I do Is that it? Disagree. I do disagree. Really? In order to solve one or two problems like that, I'm not saying all important problems, of course they are, a missing child is a, is a tragedy. <laughs> you introduce a system which weighs so heavily on society as a whole. I think it, that is the question. But what happens if, what what happens if police lose that right? I, mean, I, how think, it, that I think it would put policing back 30 years. It would I put Chardline do. back. It would put us I mean, at a great the, the, the Glasgow, people who blew up the Glasgow when they drove into the airport, mm. the police were a few minutes behind them mm. only. Yeah. All the way from London because they had the phones. Davis is also talking about emails. The, the metadata means they know exactly what email you sent to no, who. No, it no, they don't know the contents, they can, but they know. They can apply. They, in the new system, they'll be able to apply to actually say who emailed who. What are you feeling guilty about, Stanley? I'm not feeling guilty. In <laughs> what particular. is it you don't? Well, that want is the old question. Know. I mean, that's a way of saying if you've got nothing to hide, why yeah. do I do that? Yeah, that's a, that's, an, that, that's an easy way out. No, it I would think, have been a very interesting answer. I think on the answer. whole, we cannot allow government. To know too much about what we're doing. Okay, listen, uh, Esther, you're bringing us back, I suppose, in a way, to the issue of uh, immigration, migration. Foreign nurses give NHS a lesson in tender, loving care. Well, I'm sorry to say this, but my experience has been just that. When my mm. late husband was uh, in hospital um, with his, his final illness, the nurse who was wonderful was an Australian agency nurse, and the other person in the hospital was the Spanish cleaner who made us cups of tea when we sat by his bedside. While I'm afraid too many of the other nurses were gathering together at the nurses' station, chatting to each other. Now, you can't actually examine people. You can't put an official qualification on a bit of paper for care and compassion. But somehow or other, as people are saying these days, the nurses we used to describe mm. as angels are now highly qualified, but not necessarily the people we would want to know. Do you think this is about uh, national characteristics? Or it's just about numbers, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I don't mean, think it's I mean do, you think, do you think some foreign nations are intrinsically more caring? I think that they understand what the whole nursing role is. If I had a whole group of uh, trainee nurses in front of me, I would say, right, you're getting into those hospital beds and you're going to feel bloody awful and we're going to show you what it feels like when someone... Do you know, I had a friend of mine who'd lost his sight. He was in hospital age 90 with a heart attack. I asked how the food was. He hadn't eaten any because nobody had noticed he was blind <laughs> and therefore couldn't cut up his own food. Oh, yes, it takes time, but it also takes that bit of empathy and compassion. It, it, it's partially to do with making it into a graduate profession. It's the same as I always objected to the police being an entirely really? graduate profession. It's not right. You don't do it that way. Um, you need you know, lessons in life, and that's, mm. I think, what we're missing here. OK, uh, very last, uh, quick last story. Uh, Stanley Johnson, William to lead global battle against poachers. Is this what he's learning at Cambridge? I think he probably is learning something about that, but they have taken the lead, the royal family, ever since Prince, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, 
and, 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 and Prince Charles. This is a vital issue now. The elephants are going down the drain, the tigers are going down the drain, the rhinos are going down the drain. Something needs to be done. What needs to be done is to get the Chinese, above all, to cut back on their demand. And that's why William Hague, pity you didn't ask William Hague about rhinos and tigers the other, the other moment, Dermot, if I may call you Dermot. And you, you may, I'm calling you Stanley. A, I wrote a book Some called, other day. I wrote a book called Where the Wild Things Were, and that tries to pin down these issues. And this conference at Lancaster House next month maybe a start. Must end it there. Thank you very much indeed. Stanley Johnson, Esther Ransom, Lord Ian Blair. Very good to Thank see you all. Thank you once again.